Hi, everyone. Um, good morning, good night to some. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce John Brumley, who is a member of the ArtSci Collective here based in Los Angeles. Um, he's an artist and researcher based in California, and he's worked with localized networks, digital um, <laughs> virtuosity, distraction, and hidden infrastructure. And tonight, he's going to be leading a workshop um, that's kind of a continuation of his performance from the other night, where he's going to show you how to build a small loop antenna to listen to artificial and natural sources of electromagnetic radiation. So yeah. with that, I'll give it to John. Yeah, thanks, Chella. So um, yeah, just a quick intro for this workshop. It's mostly going to be kind of a talk, and a lot of it is giving like the backstory of how kind of natural radio works a little bit. Uh, related to electromagnetism, uh, different like frequencies, both in the audible and visual range, or light and sound frequencies. Um, and then we're going to cover a little bit about loop antennas. So I uh, hope you enjoy the lecture. Uh, I'll be in the chat if you have any questions, uh, so feel free to ask and I'll, I'll uh, respond there. Uh, and I'll see you uh, at the end. So, enjoy. What's been nice about today is a lot of the stuff I want to talk about was covered already um, by, by the previous presenters. So um, I can kind of fly through a little bit some of these slides about the scientific background, especially uh, uh, Dr. Jimjewski completely like that was really helpful to have all the information about waves because that's something that's hard to convey and um, yeah it's 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 helpful to get started at least to jump into as like a platform to jump into natural radio and I kind of wanted to start with this quote so again Cage is gonna come up all the time in this and this seemed like a nice, uh, a nice quote to follow up the last lecture and the previous, basically every lecture around us, but uh, related to things that are happening around us all the time and being aware to, of it and being able to tune into it. So uh, in this, it's a conversation with the composer Morton Feldman and they're talking about how Morton Feldman uh, is bothered by the sounds of radios when he goes to the beach. This is in the 60s. So everyone was hanging out on the beach with their transistor radio blaring rock and roll music. And he didn't like it. But uh, then Cage says, all the radio is, Morty, is making available to your ears what was already in the air and available to your ears, but you couldn't hear it. In other words, all it is is making audible something which you are already in. You're bathed in radio waves. And this radio simply makes audible something that you thought was inaudible. So uh, at this, and, and related to this workshop, what we're planning on doing is to create a tool that is, is able to capture and then make audible certain electromagnetic magnetic waves. So the radio waves that are around us all the time and, and you can tune into different ones and sort of pull them out of the air, materialize them into some kind of like thing that we can detect ourselves. Um, and yeah, here's just kind of a quick overview. Uh, we're going to cover some a little bit more about electromagnetic and acoustic waves. Uh, a lot was already discussed, but I think it's good to talk about that in terms of uh, natural, human-made, artificial signals, how those are interacting. Uh, then we're going to go more kind of like focus in, in deeper to radio itself and natural radio. And I'm also going to bring up a couple artists along the way that work with radio and electromagnetic uh, frequency or electromagnetic symbol signals. And um, yeah, let's just jump into it because there's there is also going to be the workshop aspect, uh, and we're going to try to build a small loop antenna that we can use to receive uh, radio in the very low frequency or VLF spectrum of radio frequency. So that's all the way kind of like if you could turn your AM dial further down, way down into uh, like into the kind of like Hertz level, uh, you'd be getting into the VLF spectrum. 
Uh, and then once we've built that, we can search around our house, listen to electromagnetic frequencies um, that are artificial because those are so strong around our houses. But it would be really nice, and this is sort of the assignment that's going to happen that you can decide to do if, if you have the ability is to go outside and actually try to find a place where you can detect and record natural radio. So again, I'll give you a quick overview of waves. And mostly I want to talk about the kind of ranges, our, our hearing ranges, what we can hear, what we can't hear. So for humans, uh, it's, it's, it's always kind of discussed and in, in, it's discussed in terms of frequency. So uh, as sound is coming into our ear and the little hairs inside of our ear organ are vibrating depending on different sounds coming in and the frequencies and then that gets transmitted to like our bones in our, in our skull and then that's turned into signals in our brain. Uh, the frequencies that we really can detect from that are in this, in this chart, it says 30 to 18 thousand hertz and the easier one to remember for me is 20 to 20 thousand hertz just because it's 20 and 20 um, and it varies and you can see here in relation to other types of animals as well as sort of like other frequencies of events that happen so severe weather for instance earthquakes these are all infrasonic tones that happen that we can't detect with our ears but maybe we can feel in our bodies you can you definitely felt the earthquake today uh, and those were sort of like infrasonic waves traveling through the earth. Um, you also have ultrasonic sounds. So if you're familiar with uh, bats and dolphins, echolocation, those are generally using ultrasonic waves. Um, I wanted to quickly bring this up. This is going to be like, this whole lecture is going to be up uh, on the site and you can come back and listen to anything, click through links because there's a lot of stuff that I can't go too deep into. But way back in 1953, it was the first recording released commercially, I guess, of sort of both uh, infrasonic sound of earthquakes, uh, as well as natural radio. So the A side of the record, if I don't know how many of you are like listening to records these days, but you can flip it over and you have an A and a B side. So the A side was all, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, infrasonic, so sounds of seismic activity on the earth, which was then pitched upward so that it would be within the hearing spectrum. So sort of taking the waveforms, shifting it so we can hear it, and then playing it back so uh, it becomes sort of like something we can absorb, like naturally, I guess, from, from our ears. And then the B side was natural radio, which we're going to talk about later. But this is an interesting recording as a sort of like document or historical document of this. Uh, another thing I kind of wanted to mention was the weaponization of sound. So in this case, this is a like uh, a high pitch frequency that's used by like businesses to try to keep people from like loitering outside of it. And kind of also what's interesting is that as we age, our hearing deteriorates. So what used to be 20 to 20,000 hertz that we could hear maybe goes down to like 15,000 hertz. Uh, so high pitch frequencies are often only heard by much younger people. So for instance, when businesses don't want teenagers to hang out in front of their like store, they play a, they play a tone that only younger people can hear. Uh, and actually, I think there was a case where people were making like ringtones in their classes that the ringtone itself was like above the hearing range of the teacher. So you could have your phone ringing, all the students could hear that your phone was ringing, but the teacher would just have no idea what was going on. That was back when people used like phones with ringtones, I guess. Uh, uh, and then additionally, and maybe in like a more serious kind of tone, um, people have been using infrasonic waves as weapons, like long range weapons to create sort of physical illness, physical, like our bodies can have physical reactions to extremely high, uh, high amplitude infrasonic uh, waves, sound waves. So maybe you remember, I think it was either earlier this year or a few years ago, there were people in the, I think it was uh, American diplomats in the Cuban consulate were complaining about feeling sick all the time and all of this stuff. And the speculation was that there was an infrasonic weapon 
being like directed at them. And, and actually this weaponization was discovered from um, some researchers in a robotics lab where one of the ventilation tubes had some kind of problem and it was creating a seven hertz uh, frequency, seven hertz that was sort of resonating throughout the entire laboratory and people were getting sick and they found out actually like seven hertz happens to be a really damaging frequency for the human body when when uh, received at a high level. So that's something else to be aware of. Um, I guess I need to go faster. <laughs> I'm like going on and on about this stuff, but uh, yeah, really quickly though, um, back to frequency. So this is just a comparison of human to animal, uh, how we voice and then how we listen. So we both are creating sounds with our vocal cords. Uh, and then we can also receive sounds. And generally, of course, if you can imagine, like most of the sounds you're going to make should fall in the range that you can detect. Um, but you can see also the ranges, like some animals are capable of receiving sounds in a much larger spectrum than humans. Um, and I think this is just getting us to think a lot about um, what are the tools that we have biologically for detecting signals. So I think, um, we were thinking about like underwater, for instance, an underwater sound, and why does sound happen? Why does why does sound sound different underwater? And part of the reason is that we're not using our standard kind of ears to listen to sound. It's vibrating through our skulls directly, so that's creating. It's not only that sound travels at a different uh, rate underwater, but it's also that our bodies are are, are detecting it in a different way or, or a different rate. So the resonance in our own kind of like bone structure is creating differences in how the how the sound gets to us. Um, and I guess it's important to talk about spectrograms. So again, like we're talking mostly about frequencies and how we detect different frequencies. So it's really important to see the spectrogram. So on the top here, you can see the sort of standard waveform where the variation in like the vertical aspect of the wave is the amplitude of the wave. So it is helpful for seeing that there are sounds happening and certain sounds are louder, some sounds are quieter. Uh, but when you wanna know, for instance, like what are the frequencies of each sound that's occurring, you can look at that over time with a spectrogram. And this is again, like an example of differences between the two and maybe what's useful about the spectrogram in relation to the waveform. Um, whew, I'm talking too fast, <laughs> I like ran out of breath actually. <laughs> Uh, so um, in this case, we're looking at birdsong. And uh, on the right side with the spectrogram, you can actually look at kind of like the shape, the frequency shape of the birdsong in relation to where on the left, maybe you can see, OK, there's two sounds that happened, two occurrences. But for instance, on the top one, you can see this is sort of like rising in pitch. There's three tones that are rising in pitch. So it, it's important to note that like, it's really useful as a tool for understanding the shape of a melody, for instance. Whereas if you just had the waveform, it would be just you'd hear there was a sound. Uh, and this is also useful for, for instance, looking at uh, if you're in linguistics, using it to analyze like uh, different uh, phonemes. Uh, and also at the Charles Taylor Laboratory, where it was a combination of linguists and ornithologists and all sorts of engineers, artists. It was a very uh, multidisciplinary lab, but they were trying to break down birdsong into like phonemes in order to like look at the grammar and structure of birdsong. So this is, um, this is a way of like kind of understanding things at a, at a granular level. Uh, and then also related, there was this project which um, I know Kyle McDonald has a relation somehow with DMA. Uh, anyway, but there was a project that Google did where it was using a neural network to classify many different types of bird song and many different types of, uh, based on the uh, spectrogram of each short instance. And you can sort of search through the bird song and find like related, uh, short related samples of bird song um, in this large map of, of different birds, uh, of different songs. And 
I happened I happened by chance to highlight the California Thrasher, which was the bird that I was focusing on when I was at the Taylor Lab, and that was just sort of like a chance happening. Um, and then I guess another relation to our environment and sound, and then using spectrograms to look at the environment and sound is for through this researcher named Bernie Krauss. Uh, he's a field recordist. He's been going all around the world recording uh, sounds in different areas, really like what you guys were doing in the first workshop of the day or, or the second workshop, second lecture, first workshop, uh, going out, making recordings, but then analyzing the recordings and trying to understand what are all the different sounds that are happening in the recording and using the spectrogram to try to sort of isolate those. So in this case, you're in an area where there happens to be an elephant, a bird, insects, and frogs. And you can see, you can kind of isolate each one when you know that this is the frequency that um, each each animal tends to populate within the frequency spectra. And, and you'll find that in a really crowded uh, audible environment, like the rainforest, for instance, uh, different animals have evolved to pop, like to live in kind of like a different band of frequency. So it helps also for communication between animals if you kind of like you've agreed or maybe evolved over time to really only focus on this one narrow band within within the frequency spectrum. Um, it also is important to understand like how humans are influencing these natural sounds and how our own sounds are creating issues with this. So in Mono Lake in California, you have on the left the sort of spade toad chorus. So this is the chorus that frogs are making in order to keep predators from finding an individual frog. So the chorus, the frogs are all around in a pond and they're making sounds. And because there's noise happening everywhere, it sort of makes it so no individual frog can be heard. Um, but on the right, you can see a jet plane that's flying overhead. It has this really intense sound and it creates breaks in the chorusing. So actually human, human made, uh, sound and human-made interventions within an environment are breaking up and disrupting some of the sort of like natural uh, defense mechanisms, at least audible defense mechanisms that animals have. <clears throat> and just also thinking again like about bands of frequency and this is now we've gone way outside of the spectrum, the frequency spectrum of like the audible and actually we're not even looking at sound waves anymore. In this one, we're looking at electromagnetic waves, uh, but this is also how uh, radio is structured. So different bands, you can see kind of vertically aligned. So if we flipped the, the, the graph we were looking at of the spectrogram uh, so that the frequency you can see kind of like listed in the middle here, we're looking at, um, this actually is, is uh, in the VLF spectrum, but you can see labeled there are different bands of transmitters that you can pick up and look at the frequencies. Um, so talking about now, like we just did, we're going to move now to electromagnetic waves. And, and the main difference to think about, and this has been sort of talked about already, is that mechanical waves are traveling through a medium, where uh, electromagnetic waves, they do travel through medium, but they can also travel in a vacuum. And they don't necessarily need a medium to be able to propagate. Uh, the other thing to note is, as you can see, uh, an electromagnetic wave, maybe implied by the name, is comprised of both an electro, uh, an electrical field as well as a magnetic field. So uh, you can see that they're orthogonal to each other. Uh, and uh, yeah, just that's important to note because, for instance, the antenna we're building only reacts to the magnetic field. And different types of antenna and different types of receivers will react to different different types of fields. Um, and I think you've already kind of covered most of this, uh, but it's important just to like, look again, Here, here's the electromagnetic spectrum. We're really concerned on the left side there, you start getting into radio waves, the longer wavelengths, the, um, the lower frequencies. Uh, here we are like breaking it down even further into the radio frequencies, and again, we're looking all the way at the left side to VLF. So really the only things populating the VLF spectrum that are 
artificial are this sort of maritime radio navigation systems, very kind of like um, usually kind of like governmental or military uh, systems. I think there are some time time like time relay systems that are happening, um, but that's primarily what it's looking at. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see that the wavelengths are going into the 10 kilometers and 100 kilometer distances. So these are like massive waves. So if you imagine the standing wave, like a guitar string that was being plucked, uh, you would have to have like a 10 kilometer long string in order to like pluck that to get the fundamental frequency uh, of that wave. Uh, and we also have artists. So again, this is Cage. Uh, it looks like the the title got cut off, but this is Imaginary Landscapes number four by John Cage, which was one of the earliest pieces to just use radio and try to use radios as a form to collect sounds from around uh, around whichever space it was in. So it's also happened to be important in the in in music history as it's, it was Cage's first like truly uh, indeterminate piece. So he was interested in the I Ching and, and creating, uh, I guess, removing the author's um, influence on the piece or like having the piece be kind of, it's on its own. So I'll, I'm just gonna play some of this uh, and you can kind of listen. Hopefully that works. Oh, there it goes. I'm just gonna jump in and turn on the sound. see they're all reading off of a score so it's score you're playing the radio as an instrument and there's a whole ensemble of radios so it's it's kind of a it's an interesting piece to think about from using radio in an artwork and bringing in indeterminacy to the act of tuning into the radio and understanding that you can turn the knob in the way that you would uh, in the same way that you might like turn the dial of a synthesizer or that you might change the pitch of a guitar, the radio as a tuning mechanism can become an instrument in its own right. Uh, this piece is also interesting in, in, in trying to understand just sort of the, the nature of radio and that it is not, it's an analog medium and that you can lose aspects of it, but you can still get some kind of signals. So for instance, when you're listening to the radio, it could be breaking up, but you still can get the song. Whereas if it was a digital signal, you might freeze or the whole connection might get dropped. Uh, this one, this artist, Katie Peterson, Patterson, uh, was bouncing. She encoded the Moonlight Sonata, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, uh, I guess the first movement, um, into Morse code, then bounced it off the surface of the moon and then received it again on the Earth. And then because of the divots and variations in the surface of the moon, different aspects of the piece were removed. So it was the Moonlight Sonata as played by the moon, you could, you could, you could say. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting thing to, I guess, think about in this context. Um, and then the radio spectrum is also like extremely politically divided. So this is the United States frequency allocations. If, if you have a permit to broadcast, and you're broadcasting your whatever signal outside of their all allocated frequency, the FCC will come to your door and, and fine you or maybe even arrest you. And this is why when we were asking, uh, when I asked Dr. Jemzewski, do you have a license for amateur radio? Uh, if you're broadcasting in the shortwave spectrum and you don't have a license to do it or you're broadcasting at the wrong uh, level, you can, you can be fined and arrested. Um, so it, it's actually something that has led to pirate radio because uh, if you're broadcasting and it's so, somehow becomes illegal to broadcast at a range that other people can hear, 
then you become a pirate. You're, you're populating, you're taking over a certain frequency uh, in order to play your own music. And this is even has led to the sort of like sea land, which is off the British, uh, off the coast in the UK, where people took over an old uh, oceanic like fort in order to create a pirate radio station that was, um, um, I guess, outside of, it, it was in international waters. And since then, the government has actually like expanded <laughs> their their international waters so that Sealand is no longer like outside of that. But there's a whole story and there's a link in the, in the notes on this if you want to read about that more. Uh, also in TV, you have uh, the sort of like Max Headroom incident. Uh, you can read again all about that, but it's co-opting existing uh, frequencies and, and finding more about like how, how you can, uh, I guess, disrupt existing uh, <laughs> restrictions on broadcasting. And, and then related to, I guess, uh, networking and network communications, which is also often running on radio through Wi-Fi. Uh, and technically you're all broadcasters if you have a house that has a Wi-Fi router in it, uh, just broadcasting in a in an amount or a, at a level that is legal still. Uh, you can you can look into here. This is this is a really good resource if you want to do some DIY networking, if you want to think about like P2P systems, if you want to think about mesh networks and alternative ways of networking that isn't necessarily living off of uh, like ISP controlled infrastructure and all of that. But that's, this is like getting into a huge diversion because uh, actually I'm gonna, well, I'll briefly talk about this because it is a, this is an interesting, uh, it's a forest that is able to mine its own cryptocurrency in order to buy itself and it exists as kind of like a network. That's also something you can look at. Uh, but back to back to antennas because we gotta we gotta get to the antenna part. Um, again, we're thinking about these radio allocations, but that's the artificial radio that we're producing. And there also happens to be a natural radio in the VLF spectrum. And as I mentioned at the beginning, 20 to 20,000 hertz is the Sorry, it's getting pretty loud in here. Um, VLF radio covers or overlaps with the audible spectrum that, that we can hear. So our audible spectrum, again, is 20 to 20,000 hertz. VLF crosses into that, even though it's a different form of wave. So again, we're listening to mechanical waves, sound waves. Uh, these are electromagnetic waves. And in order to listen to those waves, because they're overlapping in frequency, we just need a way to convert the power from sort of like electromagnetic to uh, acoustic. And uh, that's done, I guess it depends. This is a word, I guess, that changes depending on where you are, but I've always uh, known it as uh, transduction or like to transduce a signal is to change the type of energy. But uh, that you may encounter that word in, in a lot of different, uh, in a lot of different instances and it would meet it might mean a different thing so i don't want to say like i don't want to implant that in your head as what 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 the overall thing is called um, but to talk a little bit more about what natural radio is it's really a collection of sort of small bursts of uh energy that's created by lightning and electrical activity around the earth uh, you also have sound coming from the sun, or not sound, you have a signal coming from the sun, electromagnetic radiation, uh, space wind or solar winds, uh, and that's comprising different uh, aspects of natural radio. And, uh, whoops, I forgot to add the audio samples, but um, I can talk about these and we'll listen to enough natural radio uh, so you can get a sense of what these things are. And uh, I'll just talk about briefly. These are all three types of natural radio signals that are created by lightning. So the most common one is the spheric, short for atmospheric. And these are lightning that have uh, been created within maybe a few thousand kilometers within your antenna or within your detector. And these are just little clicks and pops. It kind of sounds like static, but a little bit more 
um, you can really kind of like, it, 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 it's almost like a Geiger counter, if, if you're familiar with that sound. The next step up is a tweak, which is from a bit further of a distance away. And this is when the, the waves created by the lightning strike have bounced off of the ionosphere in the atmosphere. So you have uh, part of the atmosphere that certain frequencies of waves can escape and they can actually reflect off and that creates the ability for people to uh, bounce, bounce signals off of our own atmosphere to sort of like overcome the curvature of the earth to transmit longer. So these tweaks have bounced off of our atmosphere and back to the detector and because of how maybe you could think of it like a prism, uh, because uh, light traveling through or an electromagnetic magnetic wave traveling uh, and bouncing off of a, off of a different medium uh, creates a situation where different frequencies return at different times. Uh, it, it sort of splits up the frequencies a little bit. So a tweak is a very small version of that and you get a, you get like a little bit of an adjustment and you can see at the very bottom of the tweak that it does have a slight kind of, there is a little bit more happening on the frequency. So the, in, in the spheric, you would just have a little vertical click, but on a tweak, you have a little bit of an extra kind of like um, harmonic sound or the tone is a, bit, is a bit more rich. And then you have a whistler, which I did mention that uh, the signal can bounce off the ionosphere. But occasionally, uh, and this is a much rarer occurrence, is that the um, signal coming from the lightning strike uh, can actually escape the ionosphere and get into the magnetosphere, travel on the flux lines around the Earth to the other side of the Earth. So usually when you hear this, it's coming from the other hemisphere of the Earth. And as it travels back through, you get this, uh, you get an even more extreme kind of smearing of the different frequencies uh, over time. So when it returns, you get this descending tone uh, and, it's, and it's really kind of like a, a very alien sound or like a sci-fi kind of noise. Uh, and then there's the chorus, which uh, could be, is generally seen as, well, usually when you're hearing the chorus, you're hearing a combination of all of these sounds together, um, but you're also, hearing a sort of rising sounds, lots of very like intense activity of natural radio. And this generally is happening early in the morning as the sun is rising. Um, different times of the year, it's more likely to happen when there's more activity in like more, um, uh, more electromagnetic activity around the earth. It's, it's more likely to happen I wonder if, if this, this link will open and I can actually play some of these. So uh, let's, let's listen to, well, first I'll, I'll play some whistlers. <laughs> so in that short clip, um, you could actually hear kind of all of the different types and the rising ones were a little bit of chorus. The, the descending ones were the whistlers. So that's a whistler, that, that kind of like whooshing noise. Uh, you could hear the spherics clicking away in the background. Uh, let's do this dawn. That's, that's all kind of, uh, oh really? I did not know it was that loud, sorry. Um, yeah, it was, I should have warned you. I, it's actually on my side, it's pretty quiet. <laughs> so I apologize oh. for that. <laughs> I just woke anyone up who was dozing off. Uh, let's, let's keep going on this uh, because in order, like now you know a little bit about the signals, we want to actually be able to build the device, build the antenna to receive the signal. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about induction. Um, the simplest way to think about induction is that you have sort of a coil and another coil surrounding that coil and through movement or through exchange and energy, you can induce uh, voltage within the secondary coil. So it can be two unconnected things that are then transmitting some energy or like resonating to transfer the energy from one thing to another. If you have 
for instance, a flashlight that is like an emergency flashlight that you shake in order to uh, give energy or even uh, or even like one of these like crank crank based radios that's generally they're using induction to add charge to that. Same thing with a wireless charger for a phone. There's a coil inside the charger, there's a coil inside the phone, and it's transferring energy to that. And in the case of an antenna, you have uh, the antenna oriented in this particular way. In this case, this is, this is called a dipole antenna because there are two poles. So you have a monopole, a dipole, you can have multiple poles in a Yagi orientation. It, in this case for the dipole, it's able to receive and resonate uh, with the electrical field of the electromagnetic wave, uh, which then induces an alternating current. And then that alternating current can then be kind of used to it, detect or, or get the signal out of, that, out, of, out of what was happening in that wave. And, and then you can process that and, and kind of under and, and um, capture that signal. Um, an artist that I kind of want to mention who is dealing a lot with this sort of induced sounds and electrical sounds that are generated by different parts of the world is Christina Kubisch. So she actually, uh, this is a piece where you're wearing specialized headphones and by moving around these cables that are all creating different signals, you can listen to different, different humming noises, different uh, musical tones, and I think a lot of it is about exploring electromagnetism in a musical way in the same way that uh, Cage might have been exploring radio in a musical way, or different composers have looked at, at alternative sounds in, or sounds that are generally considered noise, but allowing those to come into sort of like musical space. And this is actually a pretty good video where she, where she discusses what's going on. Hopefully not too loud. My name is Christina Kubisch and I don't know exactly what I am. I'm a composer, I am an artist, I'm a researcher, but for me it's not a separation, it all goes together. I started with composition, I started with painting and I was a flutist. But always I had the feeling it was not really what I wanted to do. On the other hand, something like sound art was not really known at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. There were just many people who tried to make something which went beyond these strictly separated fields. And I was in the middle of that. I was always interested to find technical tools which I would use in a different way. And I found this little telephone cube. It was just a white cube. You put it next to your telephone and then your voice was amplified. I bought it because I liked it and I had it in my bag when I ca came to my lessons and it was on. And then suddenly out of my bag were coming really strange noises. And uh, I asked my professor, my teacher, what is it? And he said, oh, this is electromagnetic induction. Okay, electromagnetic induction occurs any time when you have uh, something electrical going and another electrical item nearby. And um, the electrical fields are kind of transferred from one place to the other by magnetic induction. And this was like, oh, that's really interesting. That could be a technique to, to do insulation work. From 1980 to 1995, I just did installations with cables. I built cable fields, I had cable drawings on the walls, and there were many different sounds circulating in them, sounds I had produced before. The project Electrical Box actually started in 2003 when I did an installation with induction in a museum and then I had a lot of strange noises in my headphones and I couldn't get them away, not with filters, not with anything and um, a friend explained me, yeah, this is because so many digital uh, fields, so many electromagnetic fields now are around us and you can't get away with that. You have to accept it. So I had built a special headphone which was very sensitive. You put them on and these magnetic waves are picked up and transformed into a sound. You just have something like this, you put it on. It looks strange. This is a especially big one. And uh, when you walk, you become a kind of composer or mixer because if a sound is here and the next sound is there, you can walk straight through, but you can turn your head or you can jump or you can just go very slowly from one side to the other. So it's really up to your movement uh, what you do. It's a kind of 
analog interactivity, I would say. I think every walk is a kind of mirror or a kind of um, interpretation of what is around. And that's not only sounds, it's really the whole social situation. I like generally that to lead people suddenly in a place where they never have been or which they would not expect. I think it was quite difficult to make a walk in the SF MoMA, much more difficult than other places, because it's very hard to find unknown or hidden or secret places. The private public place has disappeared around here, and you hear that. This uh, was for me a really new experience because of the density of sounds. I think uh, the walk, as far as I could develop it, is, is an image of this kind of density. Cool. So hopefully that also gave a better sense of uh, induction, because I think that was an even better description than I could have offered. Um, and I think now that's just generally kind of induction or, or electromagnetic uh, fields and spaces, and we'll actually be receiving that uh, as part of the exercise that we'll, we'll do. Uh, I also just wanted to bring up Joyce Hinterding, who is specifically interested in VLF and natural radio signals and receiving that. And I know I don't want to pack too many videos into here, but this is also basically uh, in this video, Joyce Hinterding is doing the exercise that we're going to be doing. So I, I thought it just made sense to show as well. And there's also a lot of good uh, uh, VLF sounds in this. Electricity. It's a kind of uh, drone that undercurrents everything. It's full of subtlety and it's full of nuances and it's really active and it's really present. We're in this incredible kind of energetic exchange with the upper atmosphere. We live in an absolute sea of energy. Um, machines running at all these different speeds producing these incredible magnetic fields and you can move in on those magnetic fields and listen to them. covers at least the first part of that. You can watch the whole video uh, on your own time, I guess. And now we'll talk about what what Joyce Hinterding was holding right there, which was a small loop antenna. And in fact, that one was a stereo small loop antenna. You could see there were two loops happening. Uh, this is also a, this is actually a 
I guess, three channel. They're trying to have, they have three different small loop antennas trying to capture each, each different axis of, 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 um, of magnetic field uh, of, of signal that's coming in. Uh, really, the small loop antenna is just a, like the most simple way to think about it is it's, it's just a bunch of uh, copper, a bunch of wire, that's wrapped in some kind of loop-like configuration. I say loop-like because, as you can see from some of these, there are kind of squares. There are like more kite-shaped uh, things. Uh, there are loops that are like in in this bottom left one or the lower left one. It's someone just took a big spool of cable and kind of like wrapped it into a loop shape and just kind of fixed it together so it stayed in a loop and then hung it from a tree. You can also even have triangular, a triangle shape uh, that counts as much as a loop. Um, and really the amount of cable that is wrapped around is then able to resonate and, and extract from, from the surroundings the magnetic fields within this sort of VLF um, frequency range. It also is quite good at, as you just saw, picking up uh, the magnetic fields of objects in space. Um, so it's uh, what we're going to be doing. And this is a video of kind of the building process. Um, I don't know, should, do I have enough time to show the video also? Or yeah, should I? Yeah. So, so this is a video of me building building one of the frames. In fact, uh, if you look behind me, I have both both already built. So the one that you see behind me is what I'm building in this, uh, as well as showing a hula hoop based one. And uh, I'll let you you all watch this, but also don't allow yourself to be completely like this is this is what it has to be. This is how it has to look because it's really up to what you've got. And it's about kind of like improvising in order to create this loop because the detector can be sort of whatever you want it to be as long as it follows the simple rules of it's a bunch of wire wrapped <laughs> in a loop configuration. Uh, so let's, let's watch this video. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about making the antenna right now. Um, first, I'm going to show you an antenna that I've already made. I built this antenna out of a hula hoop and used the hoop as the frame for the antenna. I also used a type of cable called sprinkler cable or sprinkler wire. I also found that the hoop that I used was not large enough to go to feed the wire through the interior of the hoop. So even though part of it is going through the, the hoop, as you can see in here. Uh, the rest of it, I had to use the frame as the guide and zip tie to the frame itself. So you can see I've kind of just wrapped it around and then used these zip ties to create a stronger connection to the frame. This hoop also, in order to break open, it had two notches on the top and the bottom. Uh, in order to make a full loop around, so I had to cut both sides, which made it not as uh, stable for maintaining a hoop shape. Uh, so I'm using this like tension, I'm, I'm creating some tension with this uh, string here. Because I used sprinkler wire, uh, I wanted to um, maximize the number of turns around the, the loop. And in order to do that, I had to connect the wire from the inside to a different wire. Because there's only, because there's five wires inside of it, uh, I was able to turn a 50 foot uh, piece of wire into a 250 foot piece of wire um, just by kind of connecting uh, the individual wires between themselves to just make one long loop that goes all the way around. Uh, you can also see here's my audio output. So this is the jack that I used. Uh, I also, soldered these connections too, but originally they were just twisted. Uh, and then I also used some um, heat shrink tubing to cover them so they wouldn't accidentally uh, short between themselves if they, if they came too close. 
so that's one example of a hoop. Uh, I have another one that I want to show you. Instead of a round round loop, I was going to make a square shaped uh, antenna. It still will consider it a loop, even though it's only got four points, so that I could wrap the wire around each corner of the cross. And I just had some wood hanging around, this old kind of uh, board, four little blocks of wood, and I was able to use zip ties through through um, through the board uh, to connect the connect the wood to there in kind of the shape I needed. I also in the corners left a little bit of space so that the wire kind of won't fall off the back, but I might even need to make more space. I found a guide that recommended roughly 60 centimeters uh, for each each side of the square. It's a little bit rectangular, but I think that's okay. And it's also slightly less than 60 centimeters per side, but I think that's okay as well. I'm gonna be using this magnet wire. So let's get started with wrapping it. I'm going to need to leave one part of the wire near, um, near whatever side that I'm planning on ending it. Put it through this hole in the bottom, which seems about a good starting point. Some electrical tape. And now I can hold it a little more taut. So I'm gonna start wrapping it. And I started using a pen to, to hold around the spool so it unspooled a lot easier, just as kind of like a, an axle. And I used the entire spool in this. So this was about, I believe this was uh, eight ounces of, of wire, which uh, I don't remember the exact calculation, but I want to say it was a couple hundred feet. Probably roughly roughly 80 to 100 meters of wire. Here, I'm going to feed it through the bottom. The next step is going to be hooking up to my audio input. First, I'll feed this one also through one of the holes. I'm going to turn it onto this side. This is the input jack I'm going to use. Hopefully, you can see it with magnet wire um, so that the wires don't short when touching each other. There's a thin coating of enamel on the wire itself. Uh, that's this like reddish coat, and in order to connect it, have it connect properly with the contacts on here, you need to scrape off this enamel. So just get something sharp and try to rub it off so that it's just um, raw copper and no, no coating on the, on the wire before you try to connect it to your audio panel. I'm just using an old metal ruler that has a sharp edge on it that I can just scrape with. So um, from plugging this in, I noticed that this bottom one is the one that I'm going to want to contact, and then this back one is the other one I'm going to want to contact. Looks like I can also use this side one. This side. I just made some loops, some loops around the little coils, but it's, it's attached now. Um, you want to make sure that the copper is in contact with the coil and make sure that the two wires aren't aren't in touch with each other and then there's some space between them. Um, I need to attach this somehow. Looks like I could probably do it with the zip tie. I'm just gonna connect this here. So that seems like it's plugged in pretty well. And the next step is testing it out. So to test it out, uh, I'm gonna have a cable to plug it in. 
have my audio recorder and I'm going to listen with some headphones in to see what I can hear. And right now we're not going to pick up really, you might pick up a little bit of natural radio, but um, mostly this is going to probably pick up electrical interference from nearby. So it's probably going to pick that up, but that's kind of the idea is if it's picking up that sort of stuff, then that means we are picking up signal. And I'm going to turn on the monitoring. And you can see there's a lot of signal there. This black bar means I'm getting a bunch of signal. I'll record this so I can play it back right now. So you're going to be hearing some humming noises. You can get some changes in the noise by moving it around. You can see, depending on where I'm pointing it, I'm getting a lot of different noises. Let's go over by the computer. That's usually a pretty good spot. Now I'm way down near the computer. I'm picking up a whole lot of weird stuff. Maybe it's from the fans in the computer. And you can see, um, I'm picking up signal, and so that's a really good way to know that everything is working. So that's that's the general setup for winding it. Um, now for an exercise, what you can do is actually use this to go around your room and like check out and investigate all the different types of these humming noises are, and you can tell as you're angling it and moving it in different directions that you're going to get different sounds, and you can find out where are the big sources of electromagnetic um, radiation within your room. Um, and I think as a good exercise, we're gonna, we're gonna then try to create maps of everybody's rooms to compare, like, where, what does the mapping look like? What is a different way to look at your room just through the electromagnetic spectrum? Um, and how can you create a map of that? So that's going to do it for this workshop. Um, if you have any questions, please just post them in the chat. Uh, I'm going to add links to some of the videos in the description of this video after we finish up the stream. Um, actually, I may not have enough time for any questions, so uh, I think that's going to do it, and please uh, stick around or check out the channel for a performance coming up at 7 o'clock. Uh, so click back on the channel to see the upcoming streams. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you later.